Today we have the pleasure to talk to Łukasz Dudka, an experienced risk speaker and uh, interpreting and risk speaking trainer. We have already learned a lot about live subtitling when used on television. Live subtitling can also be used for live events outside of broadcasting settings. Are there any differences there? I believe there are many differences between live subtitling for television and live subtitling for live events. And to just name a few to give you a sense of the differences. Uh, for instance, when you work for television, you have this stability of broadcasting environment and infrastructure. So there are workstations set up, there are lots of technologies which are deployed there and it's all very stable. It's been tested and it's working the same every day. Uh, you have access to lots of support systems uh, and every day it's, it's basically the same. Whereas for live events, you move from venue to venue and you have to uh, restart your setup every time. You have to bring equipment from outside you have to always test it first, you have to connect various systems and pieces of equipment. So there are many challenges involved in that, which are just not there for television broadcasting, where you have this safety and stability uh, of having broadcasting infrastructure uh, there. Another difference is that many speakers talk of presence. So uh, when you're working for television, you are in some room, you are safe and uh, you don't have this sense of the audience being present there. Whereas for a live event, uh, you are sitting uh, very often in the very venue when, it takes, when it's taking place and there are physically people there and you have this sense of presence of being there which adds to how stressful this experience can be. How many people are there in a re-speaking team uh, when it comes to live subtitling setup for live events, uh, there's this company I work with, Dostępni.eu, which is a major accessibility services provider in Poland. So I can talk about the setup that they use. Uh, so they always have, uh, for a short event, one re-speaker and one moderator. And for longer events, they would have two re-speakers and often also two moderators, uh, that they will be taking turns uh, because we know from research that it's very difficult or impossible to sustain focus over periods longer than 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, maximum. So that's why we have two re-speakers working there and taking turns during a longer event. Uh, sometimes using interlingual, in, uh, apart from those re-speakers, we can have interpreters working with them or we can have interlingual re-speakers working directly from one language to uh, another. How are interlingual live subtitles married for live mm. events? When it comes to how uh, live subtitles are prepared for interlingual events, uh, you can have these two models. So you can either have an interpreter and then a re-speaker who works using the interpretation from the interpreter, so who, who repeats what the interpreter said, and then we have a moderator who corrects that. So that's one model using an interpreter. Another model is having interlingual re-speakers, and they would re-speak directly from one language to uh, the other. Uh, there's a great advantage to that. There is a shorter delay, because you don't need to wait for interpreter to do, his, to do his or her uh, job. But of course, you need skilled interlingual speakers uh, to make this possible, and that's what the ILSA project is all about. Can live subtitling be used instead of interpreting? Uh, yes, live subtitling can be used instead uh, of interpreting. Uh, very often it is used as a separate service on top of interpreting, and the focus here is on accessibility, on providing access to the deaf and the hard of hearing audiences. Uh, but yes, you can also use live subtitling as something that substitutes interpreting. Uh, and that can be uh, very useful for big events. Uh, and that's because for interpreting, uh, and especially simultaneous interpreting, 
for an event, what you have to do is to provide each participant with a headphone, uh, with a set of headphones and a receiver. So if it's a huge event with very large audience, this means it might be very difficult technically to get so many receivers to all these people, or it might be very costly. So actually a better solution would be to just show the translation that they need in the form of subtitles. And in this way, uh, live subtitling can be a substitute uh, for interpreting. And in fact, in some events, it's already being used uh, as a such uh, substitute. Are there situations when re-speaking just won't work? Yes, I can imagine there are situations when re-speaking just will not work. Uh, and these are situations when you would have people speaking many languages at once, uh, lots of speakers uh, who are speaking extremely fast, interrupting each other, and then re-speaking will not do a great job. But then again, there's no other method that would work in such uh, settings. So if re-speaking fails, other methods will fail too. How important is it to have standards or protocols to guide the re-speaking practice? I believe it's very important uh, to have standards and technical protocols uh, to guide re-speakers. Uh, and that's because we need criteria to evaluate uh, quality. Uh, in practice, this is very important for re-speakers because they need to know whether they are doing a good job or not. Uh, this also gets them a sense of progress in their profession. Are they getting better at what they are doing uh, or not? Uh, having uh, clear standards also eliminates uh, unfair competition when people would be providing a service uh, which is not useful to the users uh, at a lower price. Risping is a new profession compared to a translator, interpreter or even subtitle. How does it impact the working conditions, payment, cooperation with clients? Respeaking, especially used in live events, it's something new. It's a new profession, it's a new uncharted territory. And there are advantages to that as well as disadvantages. One of the disadvantages is there is a new service that people don't always know and don't always understand. So you have to educate them and you need to put this effort into educating the audiences uh, the event organizers, the people working at venues, uh, and so on. But you also have this uh, advantage of this possibility of creating new standards, of shaping this new service. Free speaking is a method used for creating live subtitles. Does it have any other uses? Uh, yes, free speaking is mainly used for uh, live subtitling. But as a method, it can have many other uses. To give you a few examples, it can be used in SDH, in regular subtitling. Instead of typing, you can use re-speaking to create a script that you then turn into subtitles. This speeds up your work uh, significantly. You can also use re-speaking to create a sort of a transcript that enables deaf interpreters to interpret an event into uh, a sign language. Uh, otherwise, deaf people wouldn't be able to work as interpreters in this context. So, re-speaking enables them to do uh, their job. Looking into the future, how do you see this professional practice evolving? I like your question about the future. Uh, let's try to sort of look into the crystal ball. What could be the future of re-speaking? And I believe there are a number of paths in front of us. So this is an exciting uh, point in time. We really don't know exactly how re-speaking will develop, but there are a few paths that it may uh, take. So one possibility is that uh, over time, intralingual re-speaking will uh, no longer be that important or that needed because speech recognition software will be getting better and better at recognizing uh, people's uh, voices and utterances. Uh, and of course, then you might ask, will there be a point when uh, re-speaking is no longer necessary because speech recognition on itself will be able to do the job? And I don't think so. As long as there are people who are using the service, using the subtitles, we will still need people involved in the process of creating it. 
Uh, and one possible scenario is that as speech recognition gets better and better, we might stop using we speaking and we will just have uh, moderators who are sort of uh, editing this text created by automatic speech recognition uh, in a similar way as people uh, in translation, instead of translating from uh, scratch, are editing uh, the products, uh, the text, this text created by machine uh, translation. So as in machine translation you have this uh, post-editing and this new profession of post-editors something similar could happen for live subtitles. Uh, but this is just one scenario. Another possible scenario, which I find quite exciting, is uh, using re-speaking together with this new field of knowledge about easy to read text. Uh, so we now know more and more about how to create easy to read texts. And we could train re-speakers to re-speak uh, simplifying the text, making it easier to understand, uh, thus increasing access to various groups of people. At the same time, such easy-to-read text uh, created by re-speakers could then be translated through machine translation to many other languages. And you probably uh, might be thinking that a machine translation is not always doing a great job at translating text. But what happens is that it's actually very good as long as you give it text which has been produced especially with machine translation in mind. So if you simplify the text, if you change the syntax, understanding the needs of machine translation, uh, such pre-edited text will uh, actually be translated with a very high degree of accuracy. And if we can achieve that well, through intralingual re-speaking, we would be able if we combine it with machine translation and with easy to read text, we would be able to deliver uh, live subtitles in multiple languages at a fraction of a cost, uh, thus increasing access to uh, people speaking other languages uh, significantly. Uh, that could be a great thing and that's a new challenge uh, for training re-speakers, teaching them the principles of easy to read text and teaching them to understand the needs of uh, machine uh, translation. Uh, there's also another scenario, perhaps uh, this cooperation between re-speakers and machine translation turns out not to work very well and interlingual re-speaking becomes more and more important and we actually need more and more interlingual re-speakers and that's also a real uh, possibility. Uh, and then you could see that re-speaking might be becoming a more and more mainstream service uh, as it substitutes interpreting. That's also a possibility because if you look at interpreting and uh, live subtitles through re-speaking, actually the process is the same. What changes is uh, the product. Uh, and uh, I could imagine that for many events where we now use interpreting, we could use live subtitles as shown on screen. And if we have people who uh, need, want to hear a uh, voice of somebody, uh, then they could hear, uh, uh, they could listen to uh, re-speakers. And maybe in the future, as a speech recognition no longer needs re-speakers to dictate punctuation, uh, the output that re-speakers produce, their voice, could also be used for people who want to hear uh, speech, a spoken uh, interpretation. That's also uh, a real possibility in the future.